Thank you back to Jonathan's uh, introduction. Uh, and thank you back to the good old days when everything worked. Uh, when I look out into the room, or, or indeed when I look in the mirror, I see quite a lot of grey hairs. So uh, I'm presuming there are quite a lot of people here who remember when uh, disease control was simple. And we would put on a, a T1 uh, at stem extension, a T2 uh, flag leaf. Sometimes we'd push the boat out and put an ear spray on, uh, and then we'd shut the gate. Uh, and then sometime after that, uh, we decided we couldn't wait until T1 and the T0 was born. Uh, and then more recently, we've started to get concerned that the gap between T1 and T2 is getting a bit long, and the idea of a T1.5 has uh, come into the frame. So. If we follow that uh, trend uh, ever further, we'll end up in a situation where we're treating uh, wheat like potatoes and spraying every seven to ten days. And I'd just like to debate whether that seems uh, a sensible idea. So let's start with a look at reality and what's actually going on on farm. These are data from the uh, National Serial Disease Survey of commercial crops. There's about 300 crops plus surveyed every year. And this is the uh, proportion of crops that are treated at each of the key timings. So I don't know if you'll be able to see along the bottom, this is the percentage of crops treated at T0, which has increased through time, the percentage of crops at T1, T2, T3, and these little black blobs uh, the crops that are receiving five or more sprays. And what you can see if you stack all those bars up, we started back in the early 90s. We were spraying crops uh, between one and a half and two times uh, on average. Uh, up to 2012, where we were treating uh, about three and a half times on average, a bit of a dip under low disease pressure in 2013. Uh, but under high pressure in 2014, uh, that's gone back up again. We don't yet have the survey pesticide usage data, but uh, Nix is giving the highest ever uh, fungicide spend on wheat in 2014 at £81 a hectare. And I guess to many of us in that room, that probably seems a fairly uh, modest budget, perhaps. So the question is, what is it that's been driving that trend? So again, if we go to the same survey for the same crops over the same period of time uh, and look at the amount of septoria on the upper canopy during grain filling, because septoria is still uh, the major driver of fungicide use. So what we see uh, here from 1990 through to 2014 is a massive fluctuation between seasons in the amount of disease we've got in the crops. And it would be quite difficult, I think, from this to argue uh, either that there's a consistent increase in disease pressure from septoria that's driving that additional treatment, uh, or indeed that the additional treatment is giving us consistently better disease control than we were obtaining previously. Although it's possible, of course, those two things might be cancelling each other out. So I think we need to just delve a bit deeper to understand what it is that's driving the increase in treatment frequency. What I'd like to do is just jump back about 15 years and remind ourselves about why the T1 and T2 timings were defined in the first place, and then we can ask whether anything's changed since then. I'll just flip on. OK. So this was a chart from the original Wheat Disease Management Guide that was published back in the year 2000. And we put this diagram into the guide for the first time at that point. Uh, and what it describes is that on leaf three, if we splay when that leaf is just fully emerged, around growth stage 32 typically, we get optimum disease control on leaf three. And similarly, if we spray at flag leaf, at T2, we get optimal control from that timing on the flag leaf. Uh, and then on the intermediate leaf, we're actually spraying at T1 a little bit before the optimum time, but, and the flag leaf a little bit after the optimum time. Uh, 
But because of the way the mathematics of how the fungicide actions combine, we actually get the equivalent from those two things as though we'd hit it with a single spray at the optimum time. Okay, so this was giving us quite good coverage across the upper leaves. So in a sense, this whole T1, T2 spray interval uh, is driven by the period over which we can get protection or eradicant action from each spray in the programme. And that period of protection or eradicant action is demonstrated by this curve here. So if we spray very early, we get poor control. As we come towards the optimum timing, we get better control. And then we get eradication and then the control falls off if we spray later. So the question is, has anything changed fundamentally in that uh, over the last 15 years to be driving this increase in, in treatment uh, frequency. So those curves in the guide weren't just sort of dreamt up. They were actually based on a lot of very detailed and careful trial measurements to define those control curves. And I've gone back to the original publication uh, which reported all those experiments uh, and pulled out uh, a curve here, which is actually for propiconazole at half dose back in 1991 uh, and 92. So what we've got here is the same curve we were just looking at, but expressed on a time scale. So zero is the optimum timing about when the leaf emerged. Obviously, if we spray 40 days too early, we don't get much control. 20 days too early, we're starting to get a bit of control. Then we hit an optimum and then we're falling off as the curative activity is, is exceeded. And with half a dose of propiconazole, we're getting a, a spray window here of use, some useful activity. So now let's just uh, jump forwards 20 years. Uh, this is uh, HGCA data from 2011 and 2013 for Seguris. So it's clearly a two-way mix of SDHI plus azole, uh, but it's at half a dose of the product. Uh, and what you can see is uh, two things. First of all, that we're generally getting better control at the peak, and also that the spray window over which we get that control is at least as wide uh, as it was uh, with good old propiconazole 20 years ago. And indeed, if we look at uh, Aviator or Adexar in the same way, uh, as Stuart mentioned, we get uh, a couple of days extra uh, curative activity compared to Seguris, so that window is a bit wider still. So with STHI, Azol mixtures, we're still getting uh, good control and a good spray window. Although it is a little bit sobering, if you look at a full dose of propiconazole in the early 1990s, we weren't actually achieving far short of what we're achieving now with, with two-way SGHI uh, azole mixtures. Okay. So we're still left with what it is that's driving the additional treatments, and I think there are a number of reasons. Uh, clearly the increase in grain value, uh, at least up till about 2013, made fungicide budgets easier to um, justify. The second thing, I think, is yellow rust. Uh, and particularly recently, uh, the new warrior race of yellow rust, which is particularly aggressive. And that aggressiveness is expressed as a shorter period from infection to sporulation, about two days shorter. And that's making the gap between T1 and T2 seem a bit long in some cases. And that's causing to think both about T noughts and this T1 and a half idea. And then at the other end of the season, I think the increased concern about mycotoxins has been driving T3 sprays to be really, to become routine. So there's perfectly legitimate reasons why this frequency of treatment has gone up. Uh, but what I'd like to consider now is uh, what the implications of that are and what the risks of that are. And there was a clue to that in the information that uh, Stuart showed um, with the decline in azole performance. And, and there are two effects going on here. Um, firstly, the, the decline in performance is causing a higher treatment frequency in order to maintain control. 
but what I'm going to go on to describe is that that increase in intensity of fungicide treatments is actually driving the decline harder. So let's just see what's going on with the pathogen. So these are data from Bart Fry's group, uh, his fungicide resistance group at Rothamsted. Um, and these are the results from thousands of samples of the septoria pathogen uh, taken from HGCA trial sites. Uh, and these are actually samples from 2013. So I'll just explain the charts. Um, along this axis is how much of the fungicide is required in a Petri dish to inhibit the growth of septoria. So anything that's out to the right-hand side needs a higher dose to uh, inhibit the growth of the pathogen. So what we've got here is a population distribution at this end of isolates of septoria that are quite easy to control, uh, and at this end, isolates that are more difficult to control. And what's been happening with the azole sensitivity is that whole curve has been shifting to the right over the last decade or so, and that's resulted in the decline that Stuart was, Stuart was showing. So what we're always really uh, keen to look at are particular isolates, which are at the extreme right-hand end of these distributions, because they're the hard cases. And we were particularly concerned here because what we found were a small number of isolates, which were both at the extreme right end of azole sensitivity but also at the extreme right end of SDHI sensitivity. <coughs> so that rang the alarm bells uh, somewhat. So Bart's group has been analysing these strains in considerable detail since then to understand what's going on. And this is a summary of his data. So this is for fungicide resistance anorax in the room. So at the top we have a, a sensitive rest reference isolate, IPO323, that's easy to control and is a sort of a normal wild type uh, septoria. The next line down, R1430, is an isolate that's pretty typical of what we've been dealing with for the last uh, several years. Uh, this is an isolate that's accumulated mutations that affect the shape of the target enzyme for the fungicide, making it more difficult for the fungicide to bind uh, and therefore reducing the effectiveness of the azoles. So now what we've got with these new isolates are two different things going on. In addition, uh, first of all, we're picking up for the first time in the UK this uh, efflux mechanism, which translated into English is that the pathogen is able to move the fungicide within the cell away from the target site and thus reduce its effect. And we've found mutations causing this efflux mechanism in these two isolates here. And it appears from the Petri dish data that it requires between five and 10 times as much uh, fungicide to control those isolates in a Petri dish um, as the isolates without that mechanism. Uh, and the critical point about this efflux mechanism is it applies to both the SDHIs and the azoles and probably uh, most other single site acting fungicides. The second thing going on uh, are mutations that we're starting to see in the target enzyme for the SDHI fungicides that are changing the shape of that enzyme and changing the sensitivity. And again, it appears that this mutation here in a Petri dish uh, means we need between five and ten times as much dose to uh, get inhibition. So that all sounds uh, quite bad, uh, but we really need to set this in context uh, because these strains are going to make virtually no difference to practical control in the field, at least in the next few years. Uh, and the reasons for that are, firstly, that that sort of change of sensitivity in a Petri dish translates to quite a small change in sensitivity in the field. Secondly, these strains are likely to be pretty unfit, so they may not compete um, very well. And, and thirdly, they're at a pretty low frequency 
at the moment, and it may therefore be unlikely that they'll increase in the immediate future. So this will make no difference at all in 2015 and in the immediate future, but it is just a really strong warning shot across the bows that this pathogen is continuing to evolve and it will overcome the SDHIs in due course. And the question is how quickly it will achieve that and to what extent we can slow that up. So let's think about that for a moment. And particularly how important is that going to be? And that rather depends on when the next new mode of action is going to come over the horizon. So if we look uh, historically, uh, the azoles were introduced in the 1970s, the strobilurins in the 1990s, the new generation SDHIs, we've just got those. Uh, and the question is, when is the next one coming along? Uh, and you'll notice they're coming along at about 20 year intervals. So what we hope is we don't have to wait 20 years for the next. Uh, and the difficulty in predicting that is, uh, is twofold. First of all, the confidentiality of the pipeline of the agrochemical uh, crop protection industry. Uh, and the second is the regulatory uncertainty uh, about new products. Um, but I can say on the first, it is certainly going to be several years uh, at best before we see a new broad spectrum systemic mode of action. Uh, and that's at best because it's difficult to predict uh, with the regulatory regime we're in currently uh, whether a particular active substance will get through the approval process or not. So we don't really know whether they're going to come into use uh, until the approval letter comes through from the regulatory authorities. So we need to look after these existing products. Let's just think about how we do that. So let's think about the increase in the intensity of fungicide programs that we've already seen uh, and which we might continue into the future and think about the implications of that for fungicide resistance. So I've put it in the simplest possible uh, terms about what the options might be. Let's imagine a sort of base spray program where you spray once at a certain dose and then later in the season you spray again at a certain dose. So we can increase the robustness of our fungicide program by increasing the dose that we apply, by keeping the dose the same but increasing the number of sprays, or we could decide we're going to split the dose, apply the same amount but over twice as many applications, or we could increase the robustness by mixing with a, a different mode of action. So we have a, a two mode of action fungicide mix. So the question is, what are the implications of those choices that we make about the selection for these new septoria strains and how fast uh, we drive resistance? Now, everybody has opinions about this, um, but we've tried to go beyond opinions. So uh, with Frank van den Bosch at Rothamsted and collaborators in Australia, uh, we've just completed a, a global review where we've gone to all of the available uh, scientific evidence where the effect of each of these individual changes was measured uh, in experiments. And that review covered all pathogens of all crops and all fungicides globally. So it's a pretty strong data set. And I've, it's a big review, but I've collapsed it down into one table. Uh, if you want to read the whole lot, it's in a review of phytopathology here. Okay. So, uh, what we see if we increase dose, uh, we found uh, two sets of studies where increasing dose decreased the selection for resistant strains. We found one where it had no effect, and we found 16 good scientific studies where selection was measured and where increasing dose but keeping the number of treatments the same increased the selection. In other words, it was driving the resistance faster. Now, if we think of the effect of the number of sprays, we found none where it decreased and six uh, good sets of studies. These are often each study multiple experiments 
where increasing the number of sprays increased selection. The next interesting one was splitting the dose, because if we split the dose, we're decreasing the dose per treatment, which ought to slow selection, but we're increasing the number of sprays, which ought to increase selection. Uh, and both theory and the experimentation say that the increase in the number of sprays outweighs the decrease in dose, and you get an increase in the drive for resistance when we split the dose and apply more treatments. So if we think about what we've been doing, we've essentially created a, a feedback loop uh, where we have a degree of resistance, we increase the number of treatments or the dose, we drive the resistance harder, and we increase the number of treatments in order to maintain control. So that's not good, uh, but there is a bit of light in this survey. Uh, if we look at the bottom line, if we add a mixture partner, the effect's completely in the opposite direction. Overwhelmingly, from all the studies, uh, adding a mixture partner of a different mode of action slows down selection for resistance. So what we need to do is maximise the benefit we're getting from that, from that approach. Okay, and this is an example of that uh, in action. Uh, this is from a, a consortium, and this is just one experiment out of a large number that produced the same, very consistently the same result. Um, what we've got here is the proportion of the pathogen population of septoria that is uh, insensitive to tebiconazole, and we used tebiconazole as a test system because it settled out with about half of the pathogen population sensitive and half of the pathogen population insensitive. And we have a very convenient genetic marker that allows us to track those two halves of the population in the field. So this is from samples uh, at the end of the season in the untreated plots, and we've got this about 50% of the population insensitive. We apply uh, tebiconazole at full dose, and essentially we remove all the sensitive isolates and the insensitive ones replace them. Uh, but what you can see here is if we add to that same azole full dose, a quarter dose of an SDHI, the selection for resistance is reduced. And if we add a full dose of SDHI, the selection is reduced even further. So we get this good mixture effect. So the only problem there, if you think about it, is uh, we're getting a benefit from the SDHI protecting the azole. But if we increase the SDHI dose, we're actually selecting more for SDHI resistance. So what we need to do is balance our mixtures to try and optimise the outcome. But there are two ways we can use mixtures without that uh, negative effect. Uh, one is the use of multi-sites, where we get the benefit to resistance selection, but multi-sites are low risk, uh, and therefore the risk of resistance to the multi-sites is, is low. Uh, and the second way we can use mixtures is a bit of a sort of intellectual leap, uh, but in principle, growing a disease-resistant variety is a perfectly good mixture strategy. So the disease-resistance genes in varieties you can think of as an additional mode of action uh, and very good mechanistic evidence to suggest that a mixture of a disease-resistant variety and a fungicide should reduce selection for fungicide resistance. So we all switched to growing resistant varieties is the conclusion from that. And there is a bit of a move in that direction, I think, already. But how far can we reasonably go with that? So uh, this illustrates a bit of the problem with that approach. Uh, if we go for these black dots are the amount of uh, septoria in untreated recommended list trials from 2014. Uh, and these yellow bars, the tops of them, represent the uh, yield achieved with the recommended list blunderbuss uh, fungicide program. And what we can see is if we go for varieties on the right-hand side that generally have better disease resistance, Cougar, um, Crusoe, for example, uh, we're also picking varieties which are towards the lower yielding end of the spectrum. 
So the question is, how does that trade off um, if we wanted to reduce fungicide resistance risk by growing more disease resistant varieties? So to answer that question, uh, another substantial consortium has come together uh, and has just started in 2014 exploring this area. Um, and we're running as part of that uh, consortium a set of variety by fungicide program uh, experiments. Uh, and we had to settle on some programs to test. So what we've got here is a low intensity fungicide program uh, with two azoles mixed with multi-site, a moderate program where we add an SGHI at T2, and we've now got three azole treatments, and then at this end, a double SGHI program uh, with four azole treatments. So this is right at the bottom end of what might possibly be done commercially, I would suggest, and this about at the top end. And then we superimpose that onto three varieties with different levels of disease resistant. Uh, and we chose Crusoe as a more resistant variety, Cuba Manita as intermediate, and Conqueror uh, as susceptible. And what you can see is, as you go from untreated to low intensity to moderate to high, yield goes up, as you would expect. And both the yields and the responses were pretty strong, so we were getting four and a half ton response on Conqueror to the high intensity program. And this is a mean of four trials in 2014. When we then look at the economics of it and calculate the gross margin over variable costs, uh, what we can see is the whole thing evens up to a large extent. And what we see is with the resistant variety, in fact, the low and moderate programs came out as most economic, and on the susceptible variety, the moderate and high programs came out as most economic. But personally, I was amazed that the low program uh, was achieving anything like this in a year like 2014. I mean, who really would have been brave enough this year to have put on that low program? So I give a health warning. This is one year's data. This work will continue, so we get a, a balanced picture above years. But I think it is, it is cause to think. Then in parallel experiments, we measured the effect of intensity on the degree of fungicide resistance selection. So these are not exactly the same treatments. But again, we use this tebiconazole sensitivity. So in untreated plots at the end of the season, we had about 50% of the population insensitive to tebiconazole. And what you can see here as we go from left to right, as we go from resistant variety through to a susceptible variety, as we go from a single spray up to three sprays, and as the total dose rises, we just drive the resistance harder and harder. And the same principle applies if we're talking about new strains that are at 1% of the population currently. The more we operate to the right-hand side of this diagram, the faster we drive the resistance. OK, so what are we actually going to do? Let's think about how we build the mixtures. So the first thing, as we said, the multi-sites are low risk. If we increase the dose or we increase the number of sprays, it doesn't really make much difference from a resistance point of view as far as the multi-sites are concerned. With the azoles, the resistance risk is moderate. We found that as we increase dose of azoles, there is an increase in selection for resistance, but it's not that strong. But increasing the number of sprays of azoles has a really strong effect. And similarly, with the SDHIs, increasing dose or increasing the number of treatments has a strongest effect on selection. And quite rightly, uh, the companies and the regulatory authorities have constrained the maximum number of SDHI treatments that we can use. So from discussions with the Fungicide Resistance Action Group, there's reasonable consensus around uh, the approach I'm going to attempt to describe, which is to start from the foundation upwards, uh, maximise the use of multi-site programmes, we must attempt to limit the number of azole treatments, and that will be a challenge. And then 
when we are using azoles to use them at robust doses. If we're mixing with SDHIs, we need robust doses because we want to protect the SDHIs. If we're applying azoles uh, without an SDHI, we need robust doses in order to get control. So the message is quite simple there. Uh, and then the SDHI is at the top of the pyramid and we need to minimise the dose and the number of treatments we require of SDHIs in order to obtain the level of control we require. So some conclusions. Uh, the combination of pesticide regulation, uh, removing active substances from use and resistance removing effective active substances is a potential car crash uh, and we need to take some avoiding action uh, particularly because the next new mode of action is probably several years away uh, what we have to realize is that the treatment decisions we make are going to determine how fast that resistance occurs the next point is, I think there's a certain mood in some quarters that the azoles can be sort of written off. Uh, and I disagree very strongly with that. Uh, azole efficacy is worth maintaining both for their own contribution to control and also for protecting the SDHIs. Uh, and to maintain the azoles, we need to be thinking carefully about how we can minimise the number of treatments. Um, so if we're aiming at T0 for... Septoria protection, then solo multi-sites. Uh, and we need to be thinking, can we, for example, if we're targeting rusts at particular timings, can we do something with QOIs and morpholines? And this is a bit of a change of thinking, but we need to explore these other options. Uh, in general, we need to be using mixtures of modes of action that are effective, and we need to be thinking about disease-resistant varieties mixed with a fungicide as a mode of action mixture. So to conclude, um, should we go further down the path we've gone? Uh, the clear answer is no. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, the potato blight pathogen has proved very slow at developing fungicide resistance, whereas the septoria pathogen is really very good uh, developing resistance and if we treat it like blight everything will stop working pretty quickly uh, and the other point is I think most of us would be really pleased to generate a crop like this that's clean to the ground um, but we shouldn't be under any illusions that by doing that we've taken out these hard case septoria strains all we've done is remove the ones that are easy to control the hard cases are still in there um, and those strains are the ones that are going to have sex with each other. Uh, they're going to produce ascospores. Those ascospores are going to fly into next year's crop. Uh, and it's those strains that are going to make our jobs more difficult next year and the year after and the year after. So we need to think about what success looks like in the field and also how we achieve it. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Neil.